So we've covered off what we've done here in the cluster and a bit of the science behind it and why we might be trying to increase soil carbon. Um, this afternoon, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to look at uh, what can we do to potentially increase that soil carbon. And then the real reason everyone's here from the farming world is to monetize it, um, which is the real bum fight. And we're going to work that out together, hopefully, and we'll have all the answers at the end of the session. Um, so, yeah, without any more ado, over to John. Okay. Those are the ones. Okay, so I, I won't take up too much of your time this afternoon because we've touched on this some of this already. Um, but as we uh, begin to think about um, carbon markets and potentially monetizing natural capital, two of the big um, issues to grapple with are additionality and permanence. So whatever we've got to demonstrate that a change in practice will result in more stuff, in more carbon, in something that we can sell, and also that that carbon is going to stick around, that there'll be some uh, permanence to it. Um, so the, the best thing to do, if, you're, if that's what you're interested in, is land use change. It's just plant trees everywhere. It's relatively straightforward. If you want more carbon, you plant lots of trees. But our starting point this afternoon, our starting point working with Tim, is that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the potential for regenerative approaches for continuing to farm, but farm in a way that builds carbon, that you have additionality and some permanence. The permanence question is quite a difficult one. Perhaps we can talk about that in discussion later. So um, Stefan's already touched on these uh, approaches, but what I'm going to do is quickly present some of the evidence for them in terms of the rate of carbon capture and the potential for these different approaches. Um, and then perhaps we'll, we'll take the discussion from there. But the focus is very much on this regenerative agriculture potential. So what I've done is I've ordered these in order of their potential contribution to increasing soil carbon stocks. And I've drawn very heavily on a review that Liz Stockdale did, who I believe is at NIA these days, uh, uh, for AHDB. And you can download this review and I highly recommend it because she's looked at all the literature and all the evidence around these things. And she summarized them in these little um, figures here. So hopefully the text is quite small, but hopefully you can see them. Um, and uh, the, uh, these are from the appendices at the, at the end of that report. And you've got all the references for them as well. And so for uh, reduced tillage or uh, minimum tillage systems, she uh, summarizes that yes, they're, they're good for reducing net, green, net greenhouse gas emissions because you've got reduced cultivation, reduced emissions. Uh, but in terms of increased organic matter, it's kind of what we know that actually you have mixed effects when you look at the literature, and it's largely to do with the redistribution of that soil organic matter. And it's often confounded by changes in soil structure. I was talking to somebody over um, lunch there about um, the potential change in soil structure and function under reduced tillage systems, certainly over the first few years. Um, and if you look at some of the, the data from the literature, we've mentioned David Paulson a lot um, today. Um, he's been really instrumental in, in driving this forward and providing the evidence for uh, some of this discussion. And uh, he uses and a number of the figures I'm going to show for what we call meta-analyses, where they look at the literature of all the papers that have quantified the effect of, for example, reduced tillage on soil carbon and compared them all and said, well, on balance, is this doing some good or, or is it not? And this is what this is. This is a meta-analysis of lots of different studies. So each point on here or the distribution of the points is an individual research paper or an individual study. And so you can see the weight of the evidence that this shows you. And they've uh, divided it up by uh, depth here. So the weight of the evidence is that reduced tillage systems increase soil carbon at the top. And we all kind of know that. And it will do. But then there's some evidence that actually, if you're on the left of this line, it means that the plowed systems have more carbon. And at depth, you know, just below the plow layer, there seems to be some evidence that you've got more carbon in plowed systems at depth. So it's a mixed story. And it's not as simple as saying reduced tillage increases soil carbon stocks, maybe more to do with the redistribution. So that's why I put that one first, but it potentially has um, 
uh, a contribution to make. Secondly, cover cropping. And here I'm talking about catch cropping as, as, as well, generally growing crops when normally you would have bare earth or, or stubble. Um, and actually, when I, I saw this, I kind of came to this exercise and thinking, oh, yeah, cover crops are kind, kind of useful, but not having a big impact. I think the evidence is showing that they have a relatively significant impact on building soil carbon. And that's what uh, Liz has found as well. And of course, we know there are associated agronomic benefits to do with reduced nitrogen leaching, potentially weed suppression um, and soil protection as well. So um, consistently positive effect on soil organic carbon, as we'll see in a moment, and also has these associated agronomic and environmental benefits. Um, as an ecologist, I'm interested in the potential contribution of different species like deep rooting chicory or, or species that might put the carbon deeper in the profile. So again, this is a meta-analysis and I was quite surprised by this. Steph, I mentioned this paper earlier, surprised as the, to the, the relative contribution of cover cropping. So you can see here the increase in soil carbon stocks, again, expressed as tons per hectare or, or megagrams per hectare. I can't remember what, oh, oh this is the, the difference in, in stocks. So I'm not sure which depth they've measured this to. And then the site time of introduction. And again, as I mentioned briefly this morning, what's encouraging is it just keeps going up. So it's not plateauing around five or 10 years. So if you keep growing cover crops, you're gonna get a consistently increasing benefit, which is what that red line is. That red line has been fitted to the data. So I don't know what that is. Um, it's 0.32 um, tons per hectare per year is the, is the increase in carbon. Um, the, the blue line that you can see there, the other lines there, that, that's modelled increase using the Roth C model that I'll introduce at the end of the talk briefly. But that is seem to be, seems to be predicting that it's non-linear and will begin to plateau. But I would be encouraged by that and saying, yeah, cover cropping works and cover cropping would be expected to continue to work. So if you're a, a blob on the box plot and you're relatively low down and you're not cover cropping, that might be one way that you can quite quickly move up. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's nice, nice paper, that one, and, and surprisingly good news, I found it. Um, Stefan's shown this already. So, so we're kind of moving up the scales of potential impact or efficacy, reduced tillage, yeah, okay, uh, cover cropping definitely, incorporating lays, we know, um, because that's kind of a halfway house to reversion, you're incorporating perennial crops into your arable uh, system. And we know from what we've seen already that uh, soil under pasture has a significantly higher um, soil carbon content than uh, purely arable cultivated systems. So incorporating a lay into the system, uh, Stefan's already shown this has uh, benefits, but you see it's, it's lumpy. And so you induce the lay, you see the increase and then it declines and you need to increase it again. So I think there's some science that needs doing um, around uh, the length and the frequency of lays and how that relates to how quickly the rate of carbon build up because we tend to think of uh, carbon as putting something into a savings account it's more like a current current account we're trying to um, reduce the rate of losses and increase how much we're putting in such that we're always in credit so we're managing the turnover uh, and then organic amendments um, so uh, the, the cover cropping and the lays, in a sense, that's new carbon. We're fixing new carbon from uh, the atmosphere through photosynthesis, and we're putting it into uh, the soil. When we look at things like uh, farmyard manure, although we know they have a really big impact on soil carbon, there is an argument that, in a sense, that's not new carbon, but you're just re redistributing it from somewhere else. Um, but uh, given that, that argument, we know that organic amendments is a very effective and potentially uh, the fastest way to build up carbon over the short to the medium term. Uh, quick word on, on, on biochar. Uh, there's lots of research on biochar and increasing uh, interest in it. Uh, but the caveat to biochar, again, is you need to do this life cycle analysis, say, where has that biochar come from? Um, and what's the relative impact of building up carbon here and the loss of carbon from where that biochar has come from? Um, but yes, lots of interesting uh, science around this. Um, Liz had a, a zero there for cash crop yields in terms of the benefit to um, uh, productivity and yields. I would question that. Um, evidence from Rotham said 
seems to imply that there's an added benefit from organic amendments over and above the, the nutrients that they're supplying. And again, thinking about the rate of buildup of soil organic carbon um, in response to organic amendments, we have lots of data like this, long-term data from Rotham said, these are from long-term experiments where we've been adding uh, farmyard manure. And again, the encouraging thing is that even after 100 years, you'll still see the buildup. So you're not reaching a plateau, it's non-linear, um, but you can continue to increase carbon over a decade or time scale. Okay, this is just, I think Stefan might have shown something like this already. Again, this is from uh, one of David Paulson's papers. But the important thing uh, to remember, as I've mentioned briefly already, is that we're not just um, measuring inputs, we need to also measure losses, and we want to make sure that our inputs are greater than our losses at any one time. And this is kind of rule of thumb where it comes to organic amendments that you need to put on 10 times as much as the amount that you would expect to see after 30 years because of that steep decline and loss and movement of carbon between different pools in the soil. Um, so when making these calculations about um, additionality and permanence and rate of buildup, these are the kind of factors that we need to build into our... Um, into, so just take a minute. Yeah. This in terms of this, like a lot of these systems are based on how the livestock is built. Yeah. And the houses that you start to look in the front end. Exactly. So we're looking at capturing carbon from forest, which is going to be played whilst we've got. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which is why it's difficult. Yeah. So this is just kind of the. The, uh, the plus side of the equation on the minus, you've got to look at emissions and, and all of the, you know, the pool farm tool, tool stuff that's over here. Um, yeah, I know, uh, just accept your point. Right, okay, so this is, I'm sure we've all got a version of, of this picture from uh, Cotswold Seeds and, and Ian on our office walls, but this is just a, 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 a word to the management of cover crops lays and pastures. We tend to say as a category, these things are good for building carbon. But I think the interesting science is how differences in the management of those things in terms of the mixture of species, where we, gra where we graze them or we top them, um, whether we feed them a bit. Um, I think that's where the really interesting science is. And I think that's where some interesting messages might come out of the data from your cluster in terms of how pastures are being managed or lays are being managed and whether we can learn something from that. Um, I'm particularly interested as a plant ecologist as to whether there are some specific species traits like rooting depth or residue quality that we can exploit if we're um, sowing a lay specifically for carbon sequestration that might be different from uh, productivity or palatability. I put down uh, the nitrogen dilemma there. That's again, a, a phrase that David Paulson uses that um, there's a very close relationship between above ground biomass or productivity and soil carbon. So if you grow more stuff, if you fix more stuff from the atmosphere through um, photosynthesis, you put more stuff into the soil. And we know that adding a bit of nitrogen and fertilizing can promote that biodiversity, but of that productivity, but obviously it has a downside in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions again. Okay, so I've nearly finished. So this is again a, a, a summary. Um, and this is a summary from um, long-term data that again, David uh, analyzed. And you can see there the, the relative impact of these different things, but also how context specific they are and the variance you see around them. And so there is certainly, because everything is to the right of the black line, there's certainly lots of potential to build carbon in the long-term using these different options. And the red line there is this four per mil target that you might be familiar with. That's kind of a global target for uh, carbon storage. And, and David's argument is that not, you know, not so many of them are, are to the right of that line. But I would be relatively encouraged that there's lots of tools out there, regenerative tools out there, that if we are below our storage potential, that we can exploit and get to. And what we're uh, now moving on, don't worry about the, the detail of this slide. What we're now moving on to in the project with, with Tim is quantifying that, uh, the rate of 
sequestration or the benefits of different interventions using these models. And the most famous model is the Roth C model. Um, it's not that complicated. It just quantifies the inputs of carbon into the system in terms of these different forms, either it's resistant plant material, which will stick around for a long time, or decomposable plant material, which turn over, turns over quite quickly, and then predicts the losses of that material over time, and that will be dependent on soil properties, on weather, and various other parameters in the model. So again, it's a way of quantifying the relative buildup versus the relative loss of carbon under different management and different environmental scenarios. And as the next step as the project, we're gonna be building this modeling exercise into our predictions of different scenarios. And with that, I'll stop because I'm, I'm aware that that probably covers some material we've already discussed, but happy to take questions.